Okay. All right, so we're changing our focus from um, bonds within molecules to forces between molecules. And we call these forces intermolecular forces, um, inter meaning between, and I usually refer to them as IMFs, intermolecular forces. Now, um, so we are going to be talking about collections of molecules molecules and forces between them. But of course, you always start with the easiest case. So you always start with the easiest case. So the easiest case is done first. And the easiest case is gases. <laughs> so if we're talking about, you know, forces between molecules, why is gases the easiest case? If I have a collection of gas molecules, anybody? They're very spaced out. Excuse me, say it a little louder. They're very spaced out. Very spaced out. So what does that mean if they're very spaced out? Like they they can separate them. There's like a- oh, Someone else can answer this too, but it, so what happens to the forces if they're very spaced out? They vibrate and they like move freely. I don't know. They definitely do all of those things. But in terms of encountering another molecule, that's a really pretty rare occurrence. So they rarely encounter each other. And yes, if they're molecules, they're vibrating, their bonds are actually going, if like a H2 molecule would be going like this, <laughs> it's moving around and it's moving very fast. These speeds are in the hundreds of, of uh, meters per second. Um, but anyway, they rarely encounter each other. So this is the easiest case because they are generally so far apart that we really say that they are non-interacting. So here I just got through telling you that we're changing our focus to the collections of molecules and the interactions between them. And the first case we actually talk about, we don't even talk about interactions between them because the only interactions are these occasional collisions with each other. And so they're basically non-interacting and that's why it's the easiest case. So that's what we start out with. That's our unit one in this course, okay, is gases where there are basically no forces between molecules. Um, and, and at least that's the case for ideal gases. Okay, except for these occasional collisions. Um, and, you know, under certain conditions, gases do not always remain non-interacting. And, 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 and a good way to think about this is, you know, when does a gas form a liquid? So what has to happen for these molecules to start noticing each other, because that's what has to happen for a gas to turn into a liquid. If these gas molecules are always far apart and never seeing each other, then they're not gonna form a liquid. So what would have to happen to make them form a liquid? They'd have, they to, have to heat up. Heat up, actually heat up, they get further away from each other. They tend to expand. But when, they, when do you get a liquid forming? If you take water vapor, you breathe on your windshield, right? In the um, cold winter night. So it's see. temperature drop, that's how they lose their energy, no? Well, yes. Well, when the temperature drops, okay, then you will get a formation of liquid. And you're absolutely right that um, that, that process is, um, is endothermic. Uh, sorry, yeah, exo exothermic loses energy, yeah, good. So um, when temperature drops, this, this, then you start to get interactions. And also another thing that can happen is if you squeeze down on these gas molecules and you increase the pressure and you put them very close together. So when the pressure goes up, you can also end up getting a liquid forming. And this is a situation we call the gas is non-ideal at this point. And Pretty soon after, you'll get condensation. Let's put that person in the meeting. 
So you'll get a liquid forming. So I, I guess I would say, I guess I would say that the, um, the consequence of gas molecules at some point interacting with each other is that liquid forms. If you didn't have any such interactions, then gases would never form a liquid. So I guess I would say that uh, forming liquid is the uh, manifestation or the consequence of eventual uh, gas molecules interacting. I'm not gonna take that out. But this only happens at low temperatures or high pressures. Okay, so under most sort of normal conditions, gas, mole gas molecules do not interact. Okay, I just wanna see something. Okay. Um, so anyway, that's unit one is gases. And then we go on to unit two, which is actually liquids and solids. Um, it sounds like, well, what do you have to say about that? But there's really a lot. So we talk a lot. So, so, so in, when you have liquid particles, right, where you know gases are like this, very far apart, liquids are closer together, and the solids are the closest, except for water, which is the exception. But that's not what we're talking about for today. So. When you have situations of solids or liquids, now you have molecules that do interact. And it's very important how they interact. Um, and it's actually responsible for all kinds of liquid properties. So what are some liquid properties? Well, it has no shape, um, but does have a volume. Well, um, so give me something, uh, something you might measure with a number. So um, when you put sanitizer on your hands and it's made of ethanol, okay, what happens? Uh, the alcohol kills off the germs. I don't, I don't want to know about killing off. But what about that liquid property? What's happening? It evaporates. It evaporates. It evaporates very fast, much faster than water. Well, why is that? Why does alcohol evaporate faster than water? So, you know, things like vapor pressure, uh, boiling point. Now, vapor pressure is a little, we'll get into it, but it has to do with that. Um, how much of that liquid actually goes in, how easily it goes into the vapor. And that's something that has to do with the attractions of neighboring molecules for each other. So you can actually look at the structure of a, of a molecule and, and say, oh yeah, that's gonna be a very high boiling liquid or that's gonna be a very low boiling liquid. Wouldn't you like to be able to do that? You know, That's what we do in this class. We actually are able to relate very, you know, physical properties to structure. So that's one big thing that that's done in unit two. So in unit two, we relate um, properties such as these to structure. And it has to do with intermolecular forces, okay? Um, so that's basically unit two. We talk a lot about boiling point, melting points, things like that. And then um, the next one, and I'm not going to go on for the whole semester, but I'm just going to tell you about unit three. So we've gone from gases, we'll go from gases to liquids and solids to um, mixtures. So that's what unit three is about. So these are, you know, liquid, liquid or liquid, solid solutions. Do they form a solution? Do, the, do solutes dissolve? Will substances dissolve in each other? You know, you know that, for example, oil and water, they do not dissolve, right? 
when you make salad dressing, you shake it up and it's, it, it might, might form an emulsion, but it doesn't form a solution. Okay, but you, if you took salt and water, that definitely dissolves. And so does sugar. And let me tell you, sugar and salt are very, very different, but they both dissolve in water. So why is that? Why do some things dissolve in each other and some don't? And again, this has to do with intermolecular forces. And there are forces between the same type of molecule, like if you have water, just a pure sample, that will determine the boiling point of water. And water molecules actually attract very strongly. That's why water has a pretty high boiling point. Um, and, and that's why your hands remain wet when you wash them with water more than ethanol. Um, but, um, but also when you talk about making a solution, now we talk about forces between the solute molecules and the solvent molecules. And if those forces are very strong, that solute is more likely to dissolve. So there's a lot of stuff that relates to these intermolecular forces. Um, so that's unit three. But that's not, you know, that's a little preview of coming attraction. So today we're gonna to just start with gases. And, um, and we'll be on the gases unit, I think for two weeks, four lectures, I think, hopefully. Um, so if gases are non-interacting, what is interesting about them? <laughs> so what's interesting or different? That we care about. <laughs> Okay, so um, I think that the most, I don't know, maybe you could come up with it, you know. Um, Brian said there's lots of empty space between particles. That is certainly a really um, big deal about gases. Lots of empty space allows them to be compressed, okay? So gases can be compressed. So I'm gonna talk about that. Okay, so what that means is that a gas sample doesn't have just one volume. You know, if you pour a liter of water, or pour water into a liter container and it's completely full, um, that's the, the volume, one liter. If you pour it into something else, it's still gonna be one liter. If you pour it into anything, it's just, it is a liter. It's very hard to do anything to that liquid to make it be anything but one liter. But a gas, you could take a gas that's in one container and put it into a much bigger container. Gases can have different volumes. So the same gas sample, that's what I'm gonna write, the same sample of gas can have many different volumes. So basically gases don't have like a fixed shape. No, they take the volume of the container. The volume of the container equals the volume of the gas. So you always know what the volume of the gas is. It's whatever the volume of the container is. But, you know, it doesn't mean that everything about that gas sample is the same because the pressure could be different or the temperature could be different. Okay, so it depends on the size of the container and also um, the volume depends on the conditions. And in, when we talk about gases, we talk about temperature and we talk about pressure. Okay, and those are very important concepts to understand for this, for this particular unit. So I, I would like to just focus a little bit on how gases are different from liquids. And I'm gonna do that by showing you this diet, this, this, these pictures. So the first one, see how far away it is. Oh, it's on the next page. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. I 
didn't do my job before class. Here it is. Okay, this is a picture I'm looking for. So this is kind of like a little piston setup. Okay, and this red stuff in here is a liquid. And, and so what I'm showing, you know, this black, the black are really, you know, the walls. But this guy here, this one here is movable. So this is that a movable wall. Okay. So let's say you put a liquid in this weird container and it fit, and you and you and it and it completely fills it and then you push this piston you try to push it in okay so you try to compress this liquid so what happens i mean if you push really hard <laughs> well, temperature increases Oh, okay. We're not playing with friction here. No, just let's let's assume the temperature doesn't change. Okay. <laughs> Although you're probably right, it would go up a little. I mean, well, if this more compressed. Well, that's the whole I, that's the whole thing is that the liquid does not compress. Even if you push really hard, liquids are really virtually incompressible. So you could work really hard pushing on this thing and what happens is essentially nothing. Where I have spell. All right. So maybe you'll get some of this red liquid squirting out the sides, you know, if you don't have a good seal. But basically, you're not going to change the volume of the liquid. So that's something that actually is used in hydraulic systems, which I don't have to spell. Um, H-Y-G-R-O, I, I mean, H-Y-G-R-O-L-I-C. Brian, it's great that you're participating, but don't do it to correct my spelling, okay? <laughs> it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and I think I spelled it right anyway. Um, so, so anyway, so we have this nice, container and if we push in on a liquid, what happens is if you have that say this sort of mechanical thing going on here, you, you would actually end up pushing out the other end of the piston. So the liquid volume is going to stay the same. It's just going to be pushed. So the outside piston is going to be moved in this direction, All right, This second piston. So you push this way, it responds, the liquid actually pushes against that piston. That's what happens in hydraulic systems like the brake lines in your car. Right? They um, the volume is constant. If you have a push on one end, it's going to end up pushing the other end. The volume of the entire thing is going to be the same. And this is actually why your your brakes work with hydraulic brake systems. Okay, what you have in your car is you have brake fluid in these lines, these like tubes in your car. And when you push the pedal, right? Actually, here's a picture of it. So if you push the pedal, you've got liquid. This is all liquid in here in the brake line. This, this yellow stuff is liquid, brake fluid. And you push the pedal, it pushes a piston in the master cylinder and it pushes this yellow stuff over. And what happens then, is it, it pushes the, it forces the liquid into these, these calipers and it pushes on a piston that ends up, so the liquid forces this blue piston here to move in against the brake pads, which are the red things. So that, that's kind of a very schematic of how a brake, a disc brake system would work. And because so that liquid, volume is constant, that's how it stops your car. Sorry, so basically you would say that the brake fluid acts as the um, pressure mechanism? Yeah, yeah, it acts as the, the, the it, it, because the volume stays the same, when you push on one side, it ends up pushing the other side. So that's how you push on the pedal and it ends up pushing the, um, these other pistons to press on the brake pads and stop the car. So if liquids didn't, 
if liquids weren't incompressible, then they, this is not how a brake system could work. It couldn't possibly do its job. And, and you know, sometimes when you have problems with your brakes, you might have air in the brake lines. And the reason that's bad is because when you push on air, the air just gets compressed, which brings me to my next little picture here, which is if this yellow stuff here were a gas and not a liquid, and you push hard enough on it, what happens is it simply compresses. Okay, now if I was in class, if I can find my little plate, my little thing here. Yeah, if I was in class, I would pass this little guy around. It's pretty scary looking syringe, isn't it? I wouldn't want to get a shot with this thing. <laughs> but anyway, what I did was when I closed that valve there is, um, you know, I close the valve. So now when I push on this thing, you could see that I'm pushing on it and the volume is getting smaller, but it's getting harder and harder to do this. And I'll talk about that more later. For now, I just want to say that um, if you push on it, okay, you end up with a smaller volume. If you push here, you end up with a smaller volume of gas. It's the same amount of gas, it's just taking up less volume, less space. So at first, when I do it with my little syringe here, at first it's pretty easy, right? But then it gets harder and harder as the volume decreases, okay? As the volume goes down, okay? So why does it get harder and harder to compress? So, you know, it's all invisible, right? I'm pushing on this thing and suddenly it's getting harder and harder. So why, why does it get harder to compress? The, the molecules uh, keep hitting each other. So they get more hit each other. Uh, so it's harder to, uh, the, there's less space for the molecules to hit, so it pushes back. That's actually true. So what's happening is the molecules are hitting. So he's talking about what's going on here is the pressure is going up, but the pressure to understand what that is, okay? The pressure ends up going up, but what is this pressure? And as he said, it's really the collisions of molecules, but specifically the collisions of molecules with the walls, the inner walls of the syringe. or in the piston system. So it's a collision of those molecules with the walls. So let's talk about, let me talk a little bit about pressure and what it is. Um, so like I said, it's caused by collisions of the molecules with the walls of any container. So the pressure in this room is caused by the collisions with my, my surface of my body, the walls of the, of the room, et cetera. And what it is actually equal to, it's really the sum of the force of all those collisions acting on a particular area of the container walls. So it's actually defined as the, um, so let me just say this is a sum of all the forces, the force, of, let me say some of the force <laughs> of all collisions with the wall on a given area. So as you push in this syringe, you have a smaller and smaller volume, right? But you have the same number of gas molecules in there. So the number of collisions with the, with, the, with the particular fixed area of wall is actually going up. And the pressure is defined as the force per unit area. So I would say that as the volume decreases, you have the same number of particles in a smaller volume. So you have a greater number 
of collisions with the walls, with a certain area of wall. And that leads to a greater pressure because you have a greater force per unit area. Okay, so we're gonna get back to this pressure volume dependence. We'll do more later on this. But what I need to tell you about are, you know, like how do we, how do you measure pressure? What are the units of pressure? Because this is very important in, in studying gases. So pressure, like I said, is force per unit area. All right, so what units would this have? Seems like they're gonna be a bit complicated, okay? So, uh, Anybody know what a force is? What is the, what's Newton's second law from physics? F equals? Mass times acceleration. That's right. It's equal to mass times acceleration. F equals MA. Okay, so the, so if I want to talk about units, the unit of force per unit area, well, area is going to be easy. It's going to be the units of force over the units of area. So units of force, or I should say the unit of force. That's going to go on the top. Mass will be in kilograms. Acceleration, what is acceleration? It's the change in the speed. So speed is meters per second. The change in speed is how many, what is the change in meters per second for every second? So it's actually meters per second per second. So it's meters per second squared. So the unit of force will be kilogram meters per second squared. And then we divide that by the unit or the units, whatever, of area. An area is meter squared, all right? Just, it's just a length squared. And so you could cancel one of these meters. And so that would make the a unit of force, uh, sorry, of pressure, be kilogram per meter second squared. So one kilogram per meter second squared. This is a unit of force that we call one Pascal. I'm sorry, I have a question. Yeah, but you have to speak up. You're very, very soft. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, kind of barely. I'm sorry, my computer's trash. Um, so in <laughs> units of area, what is that? Is that an X? M, M what? Oh, that's meters squared. Meters times meters, right? Oh, so meters squared. Okay. That's an M, yeah. So meters times meters is meters squared. Okay, that is a unit, you. sorry? Thank you. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, my computer's trash. <laughs> it's okay. All right, so that's a Pascal, which I actually never use Pascals, but I have to tell you about them because, well, you'll see. So before I talk about the pressure exerted by a gas, I'm gonna do a really simple, pressure calculation, okay? And then I'd like to sort of figure out how that compares to the pressure in the room. So let's suppose you have a nice table and that you're a better artist than I am. <laughs> so here's a table. And let's say you put a piece of poster board on that table, okay? And let's say that that piece of poster board is one square meter. Right, so this is one meter square, this here. Are you talking to me? No, I'm sorry. Okay. So we have a poster board here, a meter squared. And uh, let's see, let's suppose it weighs 100 grams. All right, so that's about a quarter of a pound. That seems like it's reasonable. So it's probably like a thick cardboard. 
Maybe I'm underestimating what it would weigh, but that's okay. It's fine for the purposes of this example. So physics tells us that the pressure that's exerted by this piece of poster board is the force per unit area. And so, okay, we know that force is mass times the acceleration. In this case, it's because of gravity. So this is the acceleration due to gravity, which is well known. So I said it's 100 grams, that's 0 0.100 kilograms, all right? So I'm going to take my 0.1 kilograms and now the acceleration due to gravity, which you can look up on the, on the web anywhere, is approximately 10 meters per second squared. So this is 10 times 0.1, all right? That actually comes out to one, 1.0 oh kilogram meter per second squared. That's the force. But now to get the pressure, I have to divide by the area, which is one, one meter squared. So force per unit area is one kilogram meter per second squared divided by one meter squared. And so that is one kilogram per meter second squared when you cancel this out. And that is one Pascal. And that is the pressure. Exerted by the poster board. Okay, you, you sort of get how that happened. <laughs> anyway, we don't do any more calculations like this particular one, but I want to show you that's what one Pascal means. Okay, now I would like to ask you how you think that pressure compares to the pressure of, you know, what the heck happened there? Oh, it was some kind of, do you want your computer to check for some kind of viruses or something? <laughs> anyway, so that's one Pascal. So my question is, how does this compare to the pressure exerted by a gas, a gas on the walls of this room or on, you know, on your body? How do you think this compares? by the molecules of air in your room right now. Do you think it's greater? Do you think it's smaller? That's interesting, what just happened? Am I not sharing anymore? No, it's not. No. Hmm. Okay. Oh. Okay, back. All right. So how does that compare to the pressure exerted by the molecules of air in this room? So you had time to think about that. So what do you think? Is it greater than the pressure exerted by the air in the room? No. <laughs> but thank you for guessing, really. Oh. Um, so it must be that the air pressure, this answer is so surprising that I, I, I'm like astounded by it. I'm astounded by it every time I say it. So I guess I would say that, that no, the, the, the pressure exerted by air is so much greater. And um, 
And so here, here's the answer. The pressure that's exerted on our bodies, on the walls, everything is way more than what this poster board exerts. And I guess I would say at sea level, which we're at here in Rhode Island, um, the pressure exerted by air is approximately one times 10 to the fifth Pascals. Now think about that for a minute. That is literally 10,000 times as much pressure as the pressure of the poster board. And I honestly, there are some things in science that I just find like totally unintuitive. And to me, you know, it's because it's this, this, this something that we experience from the day that we're born, you know, or from that, that we're always pounded on by these gas molecules and that's what our bodies are made for and we don't even notice it. So, um, but literally atmospheric pressure is one times 10 to the fifth Pascals. It's so high that, um, that we hardly ever even use Pascal units. At least I never use Pascal units in this course. I use the atmosphere and one atmosphere is 101.325 Pascals. This is uh, almost, so did I say 10,000? I meant 100,000. Yeah, just a little order of magnitude. Wait a minute, is that one, two, yeah, that's right. So that's pretty astounding. See, I don't even, 10,000, 100,000, it's just like mind boggling, mind boggling to me. So it's not even something I, I can rationalize. Am I crazy? Are you, what do you think? You think that that's reasonable? I think it's really insane. <laughs> okay. All right. So how could we measure? How to measure the pressure in this room? Okay. So, um, so how would you do that? All right. Let's see. Do I have a picture here? Oh, look at that. I have a picture. So suppose you have a pan. I'll say water and you have a graduated cylinder and you put this graduated cylinder in the water and then you stand it up. Hold on, I'm gonna actually do this. Hold on a minute. Hmm, is this gonna mess me up? I know, here, holy shit, maybe that'll work. <laughs> mm. So this is kind of a silly video because it doesn't have any sound, <laughs> but it's okay. I can find it. Wouldn't it be like a manometer maybe? Oh, well that's, that. it's, it's actually a barometer what I'm describing. A manometer is, I'll go over that a little bit later. Um, a manometer is for measuring the pressure of a sample, but here's just, this is just a silly video oh, Did I, I don't know how good it's going to come out. I don't think I selected the right. Well, I watched the two lecture videos. Sorry? I watched the two lecture videos, that one, another one before. Okay, that's or before good. Before class. All right. So, anyway, so here is. How's it coming out? It's not bad. So, all I'm doing here this is me standing in the lab where we don't have lab anymore. And I'm very carefully filling this graduated cylinder up. So there's no air bubbles and I'm turning it upside down and this whole thing is full of water way up to the tippy top, which to tell you the truth, is really a little hard to see, but that's exactly what, and I, what I should have done is picked it up and you could see all the water coming out, but I, I didn't actually do that. But anyway, that is, um, that's that. So now get back here. I'm not sharing anymore, am I? Darn it. No. And that's what happens with this computer sometimes. You can stop sharing. And, oh, let's see if it made it. Oh, I'm still good. All right. Share screen. Okay. 
Yeah, something changed between last semester and this semester with this computer. So I don't know what the heck. But anyway, so if you take this, uh oh. Is that me? It must be the next video is playing. <laughs> Writing's not that easy. But Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically correct, but it's wordy. <sighs> well, now I'm a little bit of trouble because I can't seem to share the screen anymore. I can see the one note up there. Oh yeah, you can see it. I just can't. Okay, great. That's fine. All right. So this is what I did. I filled it with water. I stood it up and the water fills the entire tube. Okay. So what if, so first of all, I'd like to ask the question, you know, why is this happening? You know, what's pushing it up? Is it a pressure? Yeah, it's the pressure from the atmosphere, which is pushing down here and is pushing the water up the tube. And that's what's shown. Oh, it's not shown in the next picture. I don't... <laughs> that's okay. I skipped a picture, but it doesn't really matter because all the picture shows is this. Okay, so this goes up because of the atmospheric pressure that is pushing down on it. Okay. So um, if I did this with a longer, suppose I use a longer and longer graduated cylinder. Will this go on forever? Will it go up and up and up and up and up? Okay, and of course it will not. No, it won't go on forever. But the question is why not? Um, and, and when does it stop going up? Doesn't the pressure even out? What do you mean even out? The pressure inside is around the same as the pressure outside. Well, what is inside and outside here? There's really all outside. You know, this PA ATM is pushing it up in here. There's no gas or anything in here, right? So you, you kind of write about evening it out in the sense of there's a balance. And what the balance is, what's going on here, there are actually two forces. So one force is the one we've been talking about, the force exerted by the atmosphere. And that pushes the liquid up the tube, okay? But what's the other force? Would it be the liquid hitting the top of the tube and pushing back down? No, it's a much more common force than that. You have a liquid going up in a tube. Is it gravity? It's gravity, absolutely, gravity. Okay, so we actually have two forces here. We have the force Usually in physics, you draw these as a diagram like this, but whatever, I'm, I'm just drawing this as an illustration. You have a force of atmosphere that's pushing the liquid up and that's constant. That just depends on whether you're you know, at the top of Mount Everest or in Rhode Island. It just depends on um, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, this, the density of air or whatever. Um, but anyway, that's constant. But when you, when that water starts going up the tube, you know, let's suppose, you know, well, as that water gets, as you keep adding more and more water, you're going to get more and more force of gravity because the gravity force depends on the mass. Okay. The force due to gravity is um, is M A, right? So it depends on the mass. And what it depends on is the mass of water in the tube, okay? Um, so 
at so when does water stop going up? How high would I have to make that tube? It would have to be extremely tall. It would have to be anybody want to guess how tall do you think it would have to be to start seeing a space on the top? What would this have to be? Uh, this is another very 34 feet. I was going to say 14. Sorry? Nothing. <laughs> OK. All right, so it would literally have to be 34 feet high um, to start seeing a space over here. So I guess I would have to say that the column of water would need to be 34 feet high in order to see a space at the top. Another kind of astounding figure to me, okay? Um, anyway, this pic, oh, and by the way, this difference in height between the pan, this level, this difference in height, so that would be 34 feet here, this difference in the height. So basically how far that thing went up versus the, the, the liquid it came from is proportional to the atmospheric pressure. Okay. So, you know, um, if you took this same barometer and went to the top of Mount Everest, you would see uh, a much, you would, this liquid would not go up as high it would maybe go to where that line is because the air is so thin there. Um, I just messed up my diagram. But. Okay, um, so this height difference is proportional to the atmospheric pressure, which is why sometimes you're given pressure in a unit that's actually a length unit. So for example, we use millimeters of mercury. Well, I've got to get to mercury. I haven't got to that yet. So the problem is <laughs> that not too many rooms would be able to have a barometer like that. So there's very few rooms <laughs> that are 34 feet high. But what you can do is, and what is done, is we use a denser liquid. So this is why mercury is used in barometers because it is a dense liquid. And that means that it, it would go up to a much smaller height before gravity um, um, basically pulls it, starts pulling it down, okay? So when this level isn't moving, when you've got it nice and stationary, then these two forces are equal, the two that I drew by the, these, two, these two forces here. And um, for atmospheric pressure, that happens with 34 feet of water being in that tube and not so for mercury. For mercury, you, it would go up just 76 centimeters of mercury would be needed. Um, to see that air, that, that um, empty space on top. So if I had a barometer with mercury in it, and actually I have a picture of one over here. So this say mercury, this is 760 millimeters or 76 centimeters. So that's about two and a half feet, you know, you could fit that in a room. You could fit that on a tabletop. You could you could hang that on your wall. In fact, what I show you here is, you know, sort of a schematic that I've been, you know, the same type of picture that I've been showing you here on the left. But this is what it actually looks like. I, uh, this is I could have taken this photograph off the wall in uh, one of the labs in Clark Science. Um, and it's actually very hard to even think that this and this is the same. Because what's going on is you have a tiny reservoir here of mercury. Because you know you don't want to expose mercury to the atmosphere. First of all, you're 
your mercury will evaporate and you won't have a barometer anymore. But secondly, it's kind of dangerous mercury vapor. It can, it can, it, it, it causes madness, right? It causes a, you know, it affects you neurologically. So, um, so anyway, there's this tiny little thing of mercury and you can't see it, but there's mercury in this column. And then you can um, see where the top of that is. And it's, uh, and so there is some open mercury on the bottom here, like in this, this section, you know, there is, there has to be, it has to be exposed to the atmosphere or it's not gonna work as a barometer, but they, you know, exposed as little surface area as possible so that it doesn't evaporate and, um, Anyway, so that's what a, this is called a Torricellian barometer. Which I'm not sure if I spelled right because I can't read it. Oh yeah. And, um, and so 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere. Okay, and another way of writing this, we also use something called the Tor for Torricelli, it's the same. And that's also uh, a Tor and a millimeter of mercury are exactly the same. So 760 Tor is also one atmosphere. And we're always converting back and forth between atmospheres and Tor and things like that. Anybody have a question? All right, so we talk a lot about gas samples. And if you have a sample of gas in a container, like in a round bottom flask or something, you'd have to, um, you know, you can't use a barometer to measure its pre pressure. So what we use instead is something we call a manometer. And this is the, um, you know, nowadays you can do this electronically, but this is the old fashioned manometer. And I have one of these in my lab in Clark Science. And, and there's mercury. It doesn't look like this because it's much taller and thinner. This looks rather strange. But you have a valve. And here's your gas sample in here. And this could be open or closed. I'm showing you, I'm showing you a closed end manometer. Um, and what you can see, so what's in here is basically vacuum. Um, there has to be a little bit of mercury vapor, but mostly there's nothing there. Um, and so what happens is you have a pressure exerted by the gas and you have basically no pressure here exerted by the vacuum, and which is why the level is higher It's higher on the right, it's lower on the left because the gas is pushing this down. And in a manometer, the difference between these two heights, so suppose this difference is, you know, 10 millimeters of mercury, then you would have, you could convert that to atmospheres. The difference is the pressure of the gas. Um, and, and like I said, there's also electronic devices that are used now um, to measure gas pressure. So we don't need to have a big apparatus like that. But we could certainly convert back and forth between pressure in millimeters of mercury or pressure in tor to pressure in atmospheres. Um, and it's very handy, you know, that we pick one atmosphere to be the atmospheric pressure at sea level, um, because that's basically what it is in the place where we live, um, more or less, you know, given a, give or take a few millimeters. So, you know, we would use these conversion factors, you know, or one. Actually, we consider these to be exact. So in other words, you wouldn't limit your sig figs to one or to three. These are considered exact. They don't affect the number of significant digits. It would be whatever it was um, before. All right. Um, 
So I'm going to continue to talk about the gas laws. Um, and I, I, I'm going to start by talking about, um, so I started actually kind of talking about this already, right? Because I showed you earlier that if a gas is compressed, if the volume goes down, then the pressure goes up. And, and that's actually, um, that, that's called Boyle's law. But to be complete about it, I would have to say at constant temperature, because the temperature can also influence the pressure and volume of a gas. And so uh, unless we keep the temperature constant, um, you know, we, we um, um, all bets are off, different things can happen, okay? Um, so anyway, I, I, I pretty much showed you this thing with the blocked syringe, right? So I didn't use my finger, I used a very nice valve. And um, as you push in on the plunger, it gets harder and harder to hold the block syringe, hold the plunger in. I showed you that because I like to say that the gas is fighting back, okay? Um, so as the volume gets smaller, the pressure is going up. And I explained why this was because you have more molecules colliding with the same surface area. Well, actually the same number of molecules colliding. You have the same number of molecules in that smaller area. So you have more collisions per unit, per unit area. Um, but anyway, Boyle's law says that the pressure is proportional to one over the volume, okay? So this is basically an inverse proportionality. Um, and, and I'm gonna actually sort of show you, you know, I had that syringe, my, that my syringe here is about 60 milliliters. So if I open up the valve and I start out at 60 milliliters, it's just sitting there. The pressure there is really one atmosphere. So I can actually come up with some data here if I have the volume in milliliters and the pressure in atmospheres, okay, um, be one atmosphere. And then if I push it down to 30 milliliters, I could, if I measured it, the pressure would be about two atmospheres, which is twice as hard, okay? Now, if I pushed it down to 15 milliliters, <clears throat> it's really hard, the pressure goes up to four atmospheres. And I could actually plot this data and what would it look like? V, so if I started out like with a big volume, say one atmosphere, like it says here. So this is P on the Y axis. And I start out with 60 here. And I'm gonna do 30. No, oh, it's not quite right for 30. And then 15. So here, that's my first point. 60, one then 32, then 15, four. It actually, you know, if I filled it in nicely, which I can't seem to do, but that's close enough. Get a nice curve that looks like that. Oh, and then I erased it. Well, there it is, it's good enough, okay? <laughs> so, um, so this is what an inverse relationship looks like. And there's something more here because pressure being proportional to one over the volume, that means that the pressure times the volume, well, actually, what does a proportion mean? If something is proportional, then it's equal to a constant times that thing. So I, if I move volume to the other side of the equation by multiplying both sides, I get PV, the product of the pressure and the volume is a constant. And if I look over here to this data, if I multiply these two out, 60 times one is 60, 30 times two is 60, 15 times four is 60. So this is PV and in, indeed it is constant. So I'm not lying to you, okay? We had, you know, the product of the pressure and the volume before it was compressed and the product after it's compressed is the same. 
And that actually is something we call Boyle's law. That's what Boyle's law is, that at constant, um, at constant pressure, um, at constant temperature, P is proportional to one over V and the pressure volume product is constant. And that means that PV before you compress it is equal to PV after. So PV under one set of conditions is the same as PV after the second set. So we write P1 V1 is P2 V2. And this is the practical way that we actually mostly use this law. Okay, and it's only true if the temperature does not change. Okay, so basically, if you have any three of these four variables, you can find what the fourth is. So if we just do a simple example, um, let's do I'll go to this activity sheet here. Okay. Um, can you, uh oh, what happened there? Um, audio went out. Oh, yeah. No, you can hear me. Oh, no, I didn't go out. Nope, it didn't. Yeah, something didn't happened, hear. but I guess it was nothing, no big deal. Thank goodness. All right. So here's a problem. The volume of five liters of gas is held at 710 torr. And if the volume, oh, oh, let's see, the if the volume is increased to eight liters with the temperature constant, what is the new pressure? So this is a volume pressure relationship. We have P1, V1 is P2, V2. I know a lot of students would like to just auto automatically plug everything in. This would be your volume, for initial volume. Um, this would be your final volume. This would be your initial pressure, P1. And so the new pressure, P2, is what you're solving for. So I know most of you would probably just plug this in. 710 tor times five liters equals P2 times eight liters and solve for P2. But I can't do that. I can't. Like, all right, I'll do it that way. I always solve for the thing I want. I would solve this for V2. So V2 would be P1 V1 over, sorry, I would solve it for P2. Duh. Maybe your way is better. <laughs> Most students solve the problem that way. But I always solve for the thing that I want and then plug in. So of course I'd be dividing both sides by eight liters. Okay. And so um, what you get is, let's see, 444 tor as P2. So what happened here was it's as if you took the syringe and instead of pushing it in, you pulled it out and you end up with a lower pressure. The volume went up and the pressure went down, okay? Um, and um, I just, to, for the purposes of showing you, uh, I could convert this to atmospheres if I wanted to. And like I said, this doesn't affect the significance. So I'll still have my three significant figures, even though this looks like it's only two, but it's considered exact. In fact, I could just write it that way and then maybe it makes it clearer. It's 0.584 atmospheres. Okay. Um, so another gas law is Charles law. So Charles law investigates um, temperature volume relationship and it has to be at constant pressure. Um, so if you picture, say, a balloon, okay. Now I pick a balloon because a balloon, it's not like a football. You know, a football has a very stiff, uh, strong outer shell. 
So you could put a pressure in there that's higher than atmospheric pressure and it would be fine, it would hold it. A balloon, I pick that because it's very flimsy and whatever the pressure inside the balloon, the same pressure would have to be outside if the balloon's volume wasn't changing. So that's why I like to pick a balloon. So let's say your balloon is at a certain temperature T1 and a volume V1. And I don't know why you would do this, except maybe for a science project, but you take a hair dryer, okay? And you very gently, you don't wanna overheat it, you'll pop the balloon. You heat up this balloon. And so now it looks like this, okay? And it's now at a higher temperature and a uh, greater volume. So volume increases as temperature increases. And, um, and there's actually a proportionality between volume and temperature. But there are some caveats I have to give you to this, okay? So um, what's assumed here um, is that the temperature is in a particular unit called the Kelvin. When you do gas problems, you actually have to be very careful about your units. Um, so heating up the balloon will cause the volume to go up. And by the way, the atmospheric pressure, the pressure exerted is the same in both cases. So P is constant. The pressure on the balloon is constant. Um, by the way, would the, would the pressure inside the balloon be constant during this process? So the atmospheric pressure, the pressure exerted on the balloon is constant. But is the pressure inside the balloon constant? So the answer to that is no, actually, because what happens when you're heating this balloon, right? You're heating it up. What causes that balloon's volume to increase? As you heat these gas molecules in here, they move more and they cause the pressure inside to go up. And so what happens is that balloon expands, okay, until the pressures equalize again. So what you have is a temporary increase of pressure inside the balloon, which causes it to expand, which then, you know, once you've expanded that balloon enough, now the pressure um, isn't higher anymore because you've increased the volume, pressure's gone down. So we say this is at constant pressure because the initial pressure is equal to the final pressure which is equal to the atmospheric pressure. But I don't want you to get the impression that the pressure inside the gas stays constant. It does not. But that doesn't mean that this law is invalid. V is proportional to T at constant pressure. And what that means is with the pressure the same at the beginning and the end. Or you could think about it as the constant of the atmospheric pressure. Oh, what did this thing do to me? Okay. Again, I got booted out of my share, but I don't know why, so, all right. Okay, so we have V is proportional to T. So, and I did give you a caveat, and that, that caveat, yeah, well, first of all, let me tell you what it means to be proportional, then I'll talk about that. So that means that if you took a sample of gas, okay, at a certain high temperature, and then you cooled it, the volume would go down and the temperature would go down. And if you did this again and again, you would get a series of points like this. Now, eventually that gas is going to liquefy. So let's suppose it liquefies over here. So I can't go any further than that. I just have this line here that I've made <laughs> if I was a better artist, okay? All right, now if I continued and extrapolated this line, as long as I had my temperature in kelvins, and I'll tell you, um, maybe some of you already know, maybe you know from Gen Chem, but to get to the temperature in kelvins, we have to take the temperature in degrees C and add 273.15.
and that is the temperature in kelvins. So if you're plotting versus kelvins, this actually goes through the origin. Um, if you're doing it in degrees C, this turns out not to go through the origin. If you have the temperature in degrees C, you'll have a situation like this. You will have an intercept. And I don't want to spend a lot of class time talking about this, but I did make a video on this. And it's called um, Temperature Scales and Charles Law. Right, and I'm, I'll check, make sure, but I think the link is on Blackboard because one of you told me you watched it already. So, so basically what this talks about is what happens if you use um, a different scale other than Kelvin's and why the Kelvin scale came about. Um, and it's, um, it's the scale where if you were to be able to extrapolate this line to zero. So, I mean, obviously our gas is never gonna have zero volume you know, keep decreasing the temperature, it turns into a liquid here. So, you know, all bets are off after that. But it turns out that if you do this for different gases, it always, if you use the temperature in kelvins, this line extrapolates to zero. Um, but that's not true if you use Celsius. So the bottom line for this is that you must use Kelvin temperature in all gas law problems because Charles's law is invalid. It's not valid if another scale is used. Um, and just to, because I don't think I ever did this in Chem 103, although I don't know about the other teachers, I'd like to show you um, just a diagram. So here are the three most common temperature scales, but there's one temperature that's left off here that's very important, but they have to put a break in the scale here. Um, and that is, you could go way down, you would have zero Kelvin. Do you anybody know what we call that? Zero Kelvin. Absolute zero. That's what it is. And it's called absolute zero because it's believed to be the, you know, you can never attain that temperature. The coldest possible temperature is just a teeny bit above absolute zero. I think they've gotten down to maybe 0. 0.000001 Kelvin, but never, scientists have never been able to get down to zero Kelvin. And zero Kelvin is negative 273.15 degrees C. And I don't know what it is. Fahrenheit, because I really don't care. Um, but anyway, so uh, you'll notice here that the boiling point of water in Celsius is 100 degrees C, okay? And that makes it, so, and you have to add 273.15 to get the Kelvin temperature. So that makes it 373 um, being the boiling point in Kelvins. And and the melting point is zero, as we know, zero degrees C, and that's 273.15 Kelvin. So the difference, the number of degrees between the boiling point and the melting point of water is 100 for Kelvins and it's 100 for degrees C. So what that basically says is that the degree size is the same for degrees C and for Kelvin, which is why it's so easy to convert back and forth. So from Kelvin's to and from Celsius, you simply take the degree C, you add 273.15 to get Kelvin, or you take Kelvin, you subtract 273.15 and you get degree C. But going back and forth from Fahrenheit to degree C is kind of a pain in the neck and um, I'm never going to ask you to do that. So you don't have to know how to do that. But you do have to know how to go back and forth between Kelvin and Celsius. And the reason this is such a pain in the neck here is because this difference between the boiling point in Fahrenheit and the melting point in Fahrenheit is 180 degrees. So 
Fahrenheit and Celsius to have degrees of very different sizes. Fahrenheit is almost half, it's, it's a little more than half of a Celsius degree, which is why it's so such a pain to convert back and forth. So I would just say, don't worry about that. Uh, don't worry about that conversion. You only need to really worry about this one. And I encourage you to, to watch that video because even though I'm not doing it in class, you still really need to watch that. You're responsible for it. So that video on temperature scales um, is a good, uh, I would like you to, to watch that. So we basically have that volume is proportional to the temperature as long as you're using Kelvins. So that means that the volume is a constant times the temperature in Kelvins, okay? So that means that V divided by T is constant. So V equals um, V over, so V over T one equals V over T. Oh, my pen is dying. It's actually breaking. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, what happened? So it looks a little bit different. It's V1 over T1 is V2 over T2 at constant pressure. That's Charles's law. That's how it's used. And just to show you an example of that, we have activity one number two. So here, here it is. Suppose you have 10 liters of a gas at 25 degrees C and it's cooled so this is T1, this is T2, but it's in a wrong unit. What volume would this gas occupy at the same pressure? We would just, um, first of all, we'd have to change these numbers to Kelvin. So we'd have to go 25 plus 273. So when you add these two together, notice what happens to the significant figures. So when you add, you keep the number of decimal places in the number with the fewest, which was 25. So you're not going to go further than the ones place, which is why I express this as 298 Kelvin. Okay, so that's 298. Negative five. All right, so now I have 273.15 minus five. Okay, again, I'm not gonna keep anything beyond the ones place. So this is 268. So it's actually only a very small change in temperature. Um, so we have V1 over T1 is V2 over T2. Um, and I would always cross multiply. And uh, then I want Let's see, I want V2, so I'll divide by T1. So then it's a matter of just substituting everything in. 10 liters, T2 is 268. And it was 298. I like to write the temperatures above and below each other. And the reason I do that is because you could see that I'm multiplying the original volume by a number 268 over 298. That number is less than one because the temperature has gone down, okay? T2 is less than T1, okay? And so I know that the volume is going to go down. And, um, and indeed, the volume ends up being nine liters, okay? So it went down just a little bit. All right, let's see. So um, let's see, it's a uh, 3.33, boy. Um, I was going to put you in some breakout rooms to, to work on number seven and eight, which are very similar, but just to make sure you know how to do it. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna try it. Um, yeah, I'll just do it randomly.
And um, I'd like to go into the rooms and talk to you a bit, but I, I know we don't have much time. So, you know, when class is over you know, at 3.50, you can just, um, you can leave. Um, but I would like to get into those rooms a little bit. So let's see, I have 55. Oh boy, I'll put it in. Well, when is activity one and two do? What do you mean? They, oh, you not not to, no, you, these are not necessarily to hand in. If you hand oh. them, I have to let you know. Thank no, you. Some of them are going to be, uh, most of them are just to do in class or to do in breakout rooms or to do at home. Or sometimes I assign them for other purposes, but I didn't do that today. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Do seven and eight, activity seven and eight. Okay. Uh, where's the link? What do you mean? Uh, to get to all the breakout rooms. Oh no, I have to, I'm doing it now. I have to do it. Oh, thank you. Did you folks want to ask me something? I see you haven't gone into the room, so if you'd rather work alone, is that what it is? Hi, Professor. Uh, for some reason, every time I'm hitting the join breakout room at the bottom, it's not showing up for me to let me leave the main room. 
I don't know what to do about that. I guess you should just work on the problem, but. Um, okay. Let me see if I can try manually to do it. Okay, thank you. I'll try a different room. <laughs> well, first, uh, try that. I don't know. Any better? Oh, it worked. Amy, Jenny, you're not going in the room with, oh, you want me to put you in the room? Yeah, let me put you in that room. Where are you, Capture? Okay. Jenny, I'm going to move you into the room with, um, I forgot her name, Megan, I said her name. Morgan, thank you. <laughs> did I do, did I tell you, did I give you room six? I think she's in room six. Yeah, that's the one that I have now. Thank you. Okay, good. All right, great. <laughs> Edward, are you having a problem? Amy? Are you there, Amy, Edward? Yeah. <sighs>
Hey, Professor, are you still here? Um, I got the same answer. I had the the the, the pressure is mixed up. I put a was it? I put a pressure. I had to just put the pressure one on the top and the pressure two on the bottom instead of pressure two on the top and pressure one on the bottom. Are you still there? Are you still there? Yeah, I, I, 
I I found a problem with that. I had the I had it before. I had it where the, the two pressures, the pressure one, the pressure two was on the top, and pressure one was on the bottom. It's uh, volume. Hey, one. Uh, Brian, are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, but I'm meeting someone else here, so I I I I wasn't even expecting you to be here. But you, did you figure out how to do your problem? Yeah, I had that was a really it was like really simple. I just had the vault, the pressures mixed up. Uh, okay. So I, had the, I had the pressure one, that pressure uh, volume one times pressure one divided by I had volume one times pressure two divided by uh, pressure one. So it was actually volume one times pressure two mean uh, times volume one times pressure one divided by volume two. Yes, that's right. Okay, good. I don't know what happened to the person I was supposed to meet here. I see him there. He says a Delon or whatever. Yeah, yeah anyway. I'm here. Oh, I'm there here. you are. Okay. Yeah, I just turned my mic off. Sorry. Oh, all right. So anyway, for this problem, um, you see number seven here, right? So what were you having trouble with? You want to so show me your work? I can show you, ask you what you did. You know, I can see what you did better than well, me just doing it, you know? Right. Um. Well, so right now, uh, I was more or less confused about the, the atmosphere inclusion. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because yes, this happens sometimes. It gives you something that you actually don't need to know uh, in this problem. So that's like a Because you notice it says at constant pressure, right? Okay. So since it's at constant pressure, you don't really need to know the pressure. So this is like an extraneous, this is unneeded. Okay, so then it would be um, 22 degrees Celsius plus 273.15? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if you line them up like this, right, you would know mm -hmm. that you shouldn't keep any decimal places because when you add things, you're limited by the decimal places. You have right. no decimal places here. So you would get um, 295.15, but you don't include those. Okay. Okay. And yep. And then we're using the next number that it was cool to. Yeah. And then we're going to do 273 plus plus uh, 196. Yeah, except it's not plus because it's negative. Oh, yeah. so minus, minus. That's right. And that's what comes out to 77.15, but you can't use that because you stop your sig figs. All right. The, so you end up your okay. 77k. So, um, so then you have the 2.5. This is the first volume. So how do you did you solve? What do you have to do here? Where do you have to put these? So I believe that we did um, we did 295. So it'd be 77 divided by 295. Yeah, but you know, let's go over why that is. Okay. Mm -hmm because you have um, V1 over V over T1 equals V2 over T2. Right. So if you cross multiply, right? Mm -hmm. So then you solve for V2 by dividing by T1. Okay. That's how you got that. Cause this is V1, this is T2 and this is T1. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot more sense now. Yeah. And then it's, and then it's leader. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because the Kelvin's cancels and you have to keep only two sig figs, one, two, because you have two sig figs here, and you're limited by that. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you very much. Good. And the next problem. So here, and again, you're given a piece of extraneous information, right? Right. So this is, you know, it said the temperature is constant. So mm -hmm. there's no need to be actually given that temperature, but, you know, you should recognize that you don't need it. Okay. So here we have P1V1 is P2V2. And what did you do here? So I didn't actually get up to this one. So um, I can kind of just go through it go through it with you again, if you don't mind. No. Um, so we would come and then do the same thing where we added uh, two, no, seven. Wait, no, 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 no. This is unneeded information. 
Oh, that, that, so that's the unneeded info. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. So then um, are we? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure with this one. The, oh, so are you in the course? You have to identify. Is this an initial? Is this P1 or P2? That would be P1. Yeah, P1, P2. Okay. And this is V1. Right. So we're solving for V2. So what is V2 going to equal? So then you do. Um, so is it seven, seven forty divided by twelve times? Twelve hundred. Right. Not oh, twelve hundred. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, and then what? And then you multiply by the point four zero zero. Yeah. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Because if you solve for V two. You would divide both sides by P2, okay? So you're multiplying the 0.4 by 740 over 1200. This is going to be less than one. So it's Correct. going to be less than 0.4, better be. Right, right. <laughs> so that's the kind of way that you can look at these problems and try to figure out which way it's going to go. And then you know when you get the answer. So there, um, yeah, I got 0 0.246. Well, yeah, you'd round up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and it's three sig figs because you have, you know, the sig figs the here, you have three, you have four, you have three. So you right. have three. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the time. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Nice to see you next time. Yep. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.